when we want to make somebody conform with the standard theory of rationality. Uh, and then, usually just by looking at the behavioral inconsistency, we can't tell which respects the agents and it's more. So to take just one of the paradigmatic examples that people always talk about, uh, say there's a behavioral inconsistency in that depending on where the um, different items are placed in the shop, uh, you might not one day pick an unhealthy snack, um, so some chocolate here, um, or on another day you might pick an apple, and some irrelevant factor in the environment cause this inconsistency. Now there are two ways of resolving this, either always take the apple or always take the chocolate, uh, which one should you take? Well, without asking the agent, and you just don't know which one is truly the agent's preference. Or you might even go so far as to say there is no fact of the matter as to what the agent's true underlying preference is. So this is the point that Bob Sutton has made quite forcibly in, in recent years. So this is the worry. We can't, just by, after having observed the inconsistency, we can't say what the agent's ends are. And so we just, we can't be needs paternalist. Uh, if we really want to be only needs paternalist, then we shouldn't interfere. Um, if we are interfering, then it's probably because we just, uh, because we think that the apple is better for the agent than the chocolate, or because we could just kind of assume that that's what anybody would want, but that's showing the kind of non-deferential attitude to the agent's judgments um, that the anti-paternalist is sort of generally opposed to. So this is a worry. Uh, in general, about means paternalist policies and behavioral welfare economics. What I want to look at is an approach, uh, specifically in the context of risk, that initially seems to do uh, better than this, because it gives us a means of, uh, it looks like identifying what the agent's ends are and then helping them better pursue them. Um, so this is in the context of risk where we see uh, violations of expected utility theory. Um, and uh, an approach that uses one descriptive theory uh, to identify the agent's ends, it seems, and then plugs them into what we think is the normatively correct theory. So my target is what I will call a CPT debiasing, so where CPT stands for Cumulative Prospect Theory as developed by Kahneman and Tversky. Um, this is analysis which assumes the descriptive adequacy of cumulative prospect theory. So this is the theory that sort of roughly accurately describes the behavior of agents, uh, and accepts the normative adequacy of expected utility theory. So agents ought to be expected utility maximizers, but as a matter of fact, um, they, their preferences abide by cumulative prospect theory uh, only. So cumulative prospect theory is, um, uh, uh, contains expected utility theory. Um, and what CPT device in that does is correct for the mistakes uh, that are embedded in cumulative uh, prospect theory preferences, so the kinds of preferences that can only be captured by cumulative prospect theory in the following way. So when we construct um, a cumulative prospect theory model of an agent's preferences, um, then that model features a utility function. So when an agent, uh, by saying that CPT is uh, descriptively adequate for an agent, uh, we're basically saying we can identify a robust uh, uh, CPT model and that CPT model will feature a utility function. And then we take that utility function and we plug that into an expected utility model of the agent. Uh, so we say the agent should maximize the expectation of that utility and we use that to make prescriptions for the agent's behavior. And this was uh, first and most prominently proposed by Blackford et al. Uh, but it has been um, quite popular amongst a variety of um, of uh, people working within cumulative prospect theory sense. And so far as such analysis aims to justify policies for which no explicit consent is sought um, from, from the people who are affected, we might uh, be able to defend it as merely means paternalist. Uh, uh, why is that? Well, it now looks like we've got this utility function and that seems to provide us with a measure of the agent's ends. And we also have expected utility theory, which we've said is the normatively correct theory, so that gives us the correct ways for the agent to pursue her ends. Um, and so we're not subject to the kind of criticism that I just gave uh, before. So um, two quick ways one might sort of dismiss this is first by insisting that CPT is not in fact descriptively adequate. Um, I'm told that uh, in fact, the, the um, empirical evidence here is more thin than it's um, often thought. Um, Harrison 
Uh, and Sparta say that RBU, for instance, so that's rank dependent utility theory, actually has better fit with the data. This might be one way of, um, of rejecting this approach. Uh, the other way of rejecting the approach would be to say that expected utility theory isn't actually the normatively correct theory. Um, so, for instance, Lara Bushnell has argued that um, prominently in the philosophical literature recently. Uh, so, these would be two quick ways of, um, of rejecting this approach, but I'm going to grant the um, descriptive adequacy of CPT and the normative adequacy of expected utility theory here. Um, and actually, one thing to say is everything I'm going to say would also apply for a parallel approach that assumes rank dependent utility theory. Um, rather than cumulative prospect theory. So what I'm going to argue is that even if uh, CPT is descriptively adequate and even if EUT is normatively adequate, uh, debiasing wealth analysis um, or CPT debiasing is paternalist uh, in a more problematic way than um, the seemingly innocuous near means paternalism. Uh, okay, so I should say a few things about what paternalism is, and they're going to be fairly hand waving because of course this is a huge debate, but I think I should say a few things about it because within, um, within the context of economics, uh, people have had a, um, a more kind of inclusive definition of what paternalism is than in the standard philosophical debate. So in the most general terms, paternalism is usually defined by uh, specifying first an interference condition, so policies and actions are only paternalist if they in some way affect an agent, they interfere with their actions or affairs in some way. Um, if an agent has explicitly consented to a measure, then it's not paternalist. Uh, and then there's the benevolence condition, which says that uh, policies or actions are only paternalist if they're motivated or justified by the agent's own good uh, or interest. There has to be this, um, that kind of motivation or justification to the policy. Now, within um, the standard philosophical debate, uh, people um, have sometimes specified the interference condition as uh, you really have to sort of limit somebody's um, freedom of choice, for instance. But I think people have been a bit more liberal with the interference condition within economics, uh, where sometimes a mere sort of effect on somebody's uh, well-being could potentially be paternalist. Sometimes, even when um, it is liberty enhancing, if um, what the uh, what the policymaker is doing is showing a kind of non-deferential attitude to the agent's own judgment in um, some sphere where the agent's judgment should be paramount. Uh, so when it, it concerns an agent's uh, well-being and not anybody else, um, for instance. So uh, people talk about paternalism sometimes when, um, when uh, uh, talking about a state um, welfare benefits, for instance, and the debate between should benefits be handed out in kind or in monetary terms, uh, often they would travel us to say that they should be handed out in kind um, because we're showing a non-deferential attitude to the agent's own consumption decisions. Um, so this is the case where actually it's the policy is liberty enhancing. Either way, the agents are better off and have more um, goods at their disposal, but the policymaker who is handing out in kind uh, benefits is showing a non-deferential attitude to what the agents want. They're giving them the kinds of goods that they think that the state thinks is good for them. Just on this welfare point, a lot of welfare recipients actually say they want benefits to be handed out in kind um, because they know they have these self-control problems over managing their finances, which means it would not satisfy the condition for paternalism that you're over, that the patient doesn't consent, the person yeah. doesn't consent to it. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it's, um, so this was just to, to illustrate that, uh, that um, the important thing is the, the kind of being non-deferential to what the agents themselves want. So in kind of benefits under those conditions where they're being consented to or through some democratic process, um, uh, the, the stakeholders themselves um, want them to be handed out this way, then it's no longer paternalist. But if it's just motivated by um, everybody else thinks that for um, benefit recipients this is the best, um, uh, then that could count as paternalist. If, um, uh, it violates what economists, I think, call um, uh, consumer sovereignty. Uh, so the, the term paternalism is, is uh, used in this sort of wider way within economics where the interference condition could potentially be quite weak. Uh, the important point is we're not, uh, we're kind of overriding the agent's own choices and judgments in a sphere where we think um, uh, they should have 
the set in the last set. The, the argument of, about in kind and in cash also requires, I think, the assumption that if you if you receive something in kind, you can't sell it at the going market price. I used to sell my free school milk when I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the milk. <laughs> did, you, did you get the did you get the market price for it? Well, I didn't really know what the market price was. <laughs> <laughs> I think this uh, emphasis on showing a non-differential attitude makes sense if you think that uh, the characteristic kind of harm of paternalism is uh, a lack of respect for an agent's autonomy, agency, or um, her own judgments. In some area where we think that is, um, uh, that it's important to show such respect. Um, now, whether a specific act of paternalism is nevertheless often considered justifiable is going to depend on two things. A, how drastic the interference is, so it's going to be worse if we're, um, if we're using physical force, say. Um, but also on just how non-differential the paternalist is, how much they're ignoring the agent's own wants. Uh, and I'm not going to have much to say about the first condition here. Um, it should be understood that when we're making any judgment about any specific case, uh, it's going to be important um, what the interference looks like. Uh, but I'm mostly concerned with the second dimension along which paternalism can be less good or bad, uh, because this is where means paternalism is supposed to be special. It's in this sense that means paternalism is considered more innocuous because we are being non-deferential when it comes to the agent's ends, and I think this is where being deferential really counts. Um, we're just being, uh, we're only being non-deferential when it comes to the means. Yeah, one question about the interference condition. So how should we think about uh, some of these examples of libertarian paternalism in this, in this context? So let's say the cafeteria. So they've got to pl put the apples in the chocolate somewhere. So it's impossible for them to not frame it one way or another. Um, should, and, and then, I mean, the, 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 let's say the, the Sunstein Taylor would say, you know, we should put the chocolate in one place rather than the other in, in order to nudge people in a particular way. But should we think of this as a, an instance of interference, given that, uh, you know, the, the cafeteria has to make some choice of putting it somewhere? It's not as if there is a sort of default placement of these uh, where the policy maker that interferes with, uh, with, with, with it. Yeah, so where kind of where choice has to be, um, where choice has to be made. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, this is somewhere outside the, yeah, the sure, kind yeah. of concern of uh, the concern of this paper. So I'm trying to think what. Uh, so this kind of definition is proposed, for instance, by Hebron and Alexander who were inspired by by Schiffman's definition of paternalism. Um, I like the definition. Yeah. I'd like to be sort of persuaded of what the sort of sense is in which we can think of this cafeteria placement as an instance of interference. Yeah, yeah. Um, one question is what would it mean to be appropriately differential here? Um, and one might think that the question is maybe just not important <coughs> enough to, um, to, to say we should always consult all the stakeholders about um, what the correct placement of, um, of, of snacks is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what they would say about it intuitively. I'm, I'm unsure about the case myself. I'm not sure this would work in every instance, but could you argue that the default position should be market driven, i.e., customer responsive, i.e., you place the chocolate and the apples wherever you generate the greatest marginal dollar? Yeah, and anything okay, other than that is clearly designed to be influencing behavior for another non-monetary purpose. Mm. Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, this definition is one that, uh, that is very straightforward when we're talking about a policymaker. Uh, the, the state, as it were, should be deferential to their citizens. Um, they sh shouldn't be uh, imposing any kind of idea of the good life, so if we're using a kind of liberal justification of anti-paternalism. Um, in the cafeteria, if it's a private cafeteria, it's, it's not clear whether the same um, kind of norms of of deference um, even apply. Um, but yeah, if it's a public cafeteria, um, then yeah. Uh, wouldn't the degree of benevolence be relevant for the justifiability of, of the paternalistic uh, intervention? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I should have um, I should have put that there as well. That's going to be another, yeah, so it uh, will depend on at least two things. Yeah. 
um, I guess those are the things that are um, that are characteristic of. So these are the things that make the harm of paternalism uh, more severe or less severe. Um, how uh, how much good we're actually doing is kind of on the pro side that might make us in the end all things considered say that paternalism was okay. So, so exactly following from that, can I ask about a uh, how drastic the interference is because. You can imagine interference with acts, and let's say, you know, uh, somehow getting somebody to choose something which is, some, in some intuitive sense, very, very different from what they would have done otherwise. But if their preferences are uh, based on outcomes and only on outcomes, it could still be that the two acts, although they look very different, lead to outcomes which are very, very close, or even possibly the same. Yeah. So, Actually, I'll, I'll come precisely to, okay. um, to this kind of point in a, uh, in a moment, and that has to do with the, with the main concern of the paper. Um, so just to, to kind of uh, but say more clearly again what means paternalism is, um, and I've said most of those things, it respects the agent's subjective ends, it only overrides the agent's judgments about or choices of appropriate means to those ends. So I should actually uh, start talking about cumulative prospect uh, theory a little bit. Um, so we in here. Um, okay, so this is what um, the means paternalism is, and we might see, we might think that it's apt in cases where agents are choosing badly in light of their own ends. So, for instance, because of false beliefs or the complexity of the decision problem, or because of weakness of will, it might seem we can help them uh, pursue their own ends uh, better uh, using means paternalist uh, means. So just one kind of side remark, uh, means paternalism is different from what's sometimes called soft paternalism, uh, which allows a difference for an agent's good when her actions are substantially non-voluntary. Uh, because one might think sometimes we just make bad judgments about means in cases where we are acting fully voluntarily. In those kinds of cases, means paternalists could interfere, where soft paternalists um, couldn't. But at the same time, uh, means paternalists are constrained to only acting um, only opposing the agent's own ends uh, rather than as the soft paternalist in the kinds of cases where it's non-voluntary, at least how it's usually specified, they interfere for the agent's good rather than uh, for the agent's good as um, seen by herself. So it's slightly different from soft paternalism. Um, what is attractive about means paternalism? Um, so it's a, it's a view that um, I think is, uh, so sometimes it's even, uh, I think Bernheim claims that uh, all behavioral welfare economists are um, means good analysts, it's certainly a very widespread view. So what makes it attractive to economists who are actually generally anti-paternalist? Why um, is this less bad? Um, well, I just want to give the three potential lines of defense, which um, uh, each of them kind of appeals to a standard anti-paternalist argument and says um, means paternalism isn't subject to that. So one standard argument for anti-paternalism is, well, if we are subjectivists about well-being, so if we think that uh, what determines what's good for you is actually your own judgments and preferences, um, so preference satisfaction accounts of well-being, if that is your account of well-being, then you, the only way of making people better off is being deferential to their own judgments, because their judgments determine what's good for them. Um, but even preference satisfaction accounts uh, would usually say that it's only judgments about uh, non-instrumental goods, judgments about ends that pick out the agent's well-being, because otherwise uh, an agent who has, say, false belief about the glass in front of her being a glass of water when it's actually petrol, would need to say that it's good for her to drink that <coughs> glass of petrol. Uh, the only plausible accounts of, uh, the only possible subjectivist accounts of well-being would say um, your judgments and uh, your non-instrumental judgments, your judgments about intrinsic value, those are the ones that pick up what's good for you. So this would be a kind of, uh, the only kind of paternalism that would be acceptable to subjectivists about well-being. Another standard anti-paternalist argument um, is uh, a pragmatic one that says, uh, it's just plausible that agents usually are better judgments of their own well, uh, judge, judges of their own well-being than the policy makers. And I think that is a very plausible when it comes to non-instrumental components of well-being. Um, but one might think they aren't necessarily the best judges uh, of the best means to them. So perhaps the policymaker does know more about what is healthy or unhealthy for people. 
And so when it comes to means, potentially, um, this sort of uh, old anti-paternalist bit of wisdom that agents are the best judges um, of their own well-being doesn't hold. And lastly, uh, I already hinted earlier at a kind of liberal justification by anti-paternalism. Um, so here the idea is that a state should remain neutral between different conceptions of the good so as to accommodate the inevitable plurality of conceptions of the good we have in a society. Um, so this is the idea of liberal neutrality. Uh, means paternalism respects liberal neutrality where it counts, uh, right? I think it, it, can, um, it is neutral about people's conception of the good life. Um, it's just non-neutral about uh, what are the best means to take them. Uh, so for these reasons, I think, uh, means paternalism seems more um, acceptable even to people who generally buy into anti-paternalist arguments. Okay, so along these lines, I think there are two necessary conditions that we that would have to hold for some uh, particular uh, means paternalist or um, uh, presumptively means paternalist policy to be permissible for people who have anti general anti-paternalist sympathies. Firstly, the policymaker would need to have some reliable way of determining what the target agent's relevant ends or intrinsic non-instrumental values are. If she didn't have that, she couldn't be deferential where it counts, show respect where it counts. Uh, and secondly, the policymaker needs to be confident that she can make a superior judgment about the best means to the agent's ends than the agent herself. Because if that wasn't given, there wouldn't be any kind of positive reason to interfere uh, if the agent knew just as well as the policymaker how to um, serve her ends, then um, we should err on the side of uh, deferring to the agent again on the side of non-interference. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, because this is important for the, for the main argument I want to make, is that the second condition is sometimes not satisfied, even if the first condition is, so we've identified the agent's ends, and even if the policymaker can identify a rational way for the agent to pursue her ends namely in cases where instrumental rationality is permissive. So just take a very stylized example where um, there are two different roads that lead an agent to her goals um, equally well. Uh, there's nothing, um, there are no kind of intrinsic values attached to the different two different roads um, in terms of everything the agent non-instrumentally cares about. They are the same. There are two equally good ways of serving her ends, getting her to her goal, but the agent prefers the left route. If a policymaker were to interfere and impose the right route on her, um, this would be a more a problematic kind of uh, means paternalism. It's means paternalist in the sense that we're respecting the agent's goals, we're only interfering with the means, but we're doing so in a case where <coughs> her own preferred way of getting to her goal would have been a, a just as good a way of serving her ends. Uh, there seems to be no positive reason for interfering in this kind of case. Um, and moreover, it, uh, it seems like we're actually violating some kind of neutrality again, that when rationality is permissive, we should allow people um, uh, to go with their own uh, preferred ways of how to pursue their ends. Um, okay, so uh, there's this kind of special kind of means paternalism that would be more problematic because uh, when instrumental rationality is permissive. Uh, now, CPT debiasing seems initially like a promising way to identify acceptable policies um, because it seems like we can identify the utility function, which picks up the ends, and we have EUT, which tells us how to pursue them. Uh, but I will argue that, in fact, uh, it violates both of these conditions. Okay, so uh, just to say a few more things, I mean, this will be uh, as uh, non technical as possible. Uh, about expected utility theory and cumulative prospect theory in the context of risk. So this is a context where the probabilities are given. What uh, the EUT model would feature, and this is the kind of model that we think is normatively adequate, is uh, an externally given probability function and the utility function over um, absolute outcomes. And then how we determine the value of lotteries in the context of risk uh, where different outcomes might occur as the um, consequence of your choices. Each outcome occurs with a particular probability. We calculate the probability weighted sum of outcome utilities. Uh, now this was just specifying what the model looks like. Um, now preferences are representable as such with such a model if they abide by 
Um, and well, this is the most uh, this is the most um, uh, popular representation theorem amongst economists, uh, the polynomial Morgenstern uh, representation theorem. If these preference is high by the VNN axioms, including, for instance, transitivity or the independence axiom. So we've got these conditions of preferences that guarantee that an agent can be uh, can be represented with such a model. In practice, um, what we do is we, can, we find an EUT model that best fits the kinds of uh, preferences that we observe in people's choices. Um, and there could be sort of small violations, um, and usually we're just looking for kind of good enough fit. But the argument um, by behavioral welfare economists, uh, by behavioral economists is that we don't even get a good enough fit with this kind of model, we get systematic deviations from this kind of model. Uh, instead, uh, cumulative prospect theory is often thought to be um, an adequate descriptive theory of choice and the risk. Uh, and the models there are more complex than the expected utility models. We've got, again, the externally given probability function. But then we've also got weights on this probability function, uh, sometimes referred to decision <coughs> weights. Uh, there's a basic utility function defined over outcomes that um, are de defined against a reference point. So we, um, we identify status quo and then we describe, say, monetary outcomes as gains or losses uh, uh, in relation to this reference point. We've got a basic utility function over outcomes described in this way. Uh, then we also have a composite utility function where the losses are weighted by this um, parameter lambda, which is uh, usually called the loss aversion parameter. Uh, so losses are uh, now given a stronger weight. So this is our composite utility function. And the total value of lotteries is determined by combining uh, weighted probabilities with composite utilities. It's not a um, weighted sum as an expected utility theory, it's a bit more complicated. You take the best outcome and um, weighted by the weighted probability of, um, of getting at least that outcome. And you take the second best outcome and you weight it by um, the weighted probability of uh, receiving at least that outcome minus the weighted probability of receiving the best. So it's slightly more complicated, but basically what this weighting of probabilities does is allow us to give greater weight to the worst outcomes uh, than would be the case under expected utility theory, or lesser weight, uh, depending on what the decision weights are. So there are three main differences in the CPT model. There's reference dependence, there's the loss aversion parameter, and then there's uh, probability weighting. And preferences are representable as such for such a model if they abide by weaker axioms. So there are representation theorems for this as well. It's a more permissive theory than expected utility theory. Um, but it's also uh, a more kind of uh, complex model than expected utility theory. So what CPT debiasing does basically is we're saying CPT is descriptively adequate, so we found a model that has good fit that takes this kind of shape, which means we have a robust measure of lambda, a robust measure of the basic utility function of the composite utility function and the um, probability weights. Uh, we take the basic utility function uh, from the CPT model, and then we plug it into an EUT model. We use that as the utility function in an expected utility population. Now, CPT debiasing would meet the necessary conditions for an acceptable means paternalism if the basic CPT utility function was a measure of the agent's ends, and if maximizing the expectation of that measure was the only rational way uh, to serve them. Uh, but neither of these um, Things are true, is what I want to argue. So, first challenge is um, we would want the utility, basic utility function in CPT to isolate the agent's ends. Um, and I want to go through three worries about uh, its ability to do so. The first one is that, at least at first sight, agents sometimes have ends that look irreducible to valuations of outcomes or that are not most naturally thought of as. Um, features of an outcome. So for instance, if we have attitudes regarding the thrill of gambling or the anxiety of uncertainty, structural features of gambles, um, such as their mean mode invariance, uh, attitudes to those things aren't naturally described as attitudes to outcomes. They look like irreducible um, attitudes to, uh, to lotteries, which are probability distributions over outcomes. 
And nevertheless, we might think that these preferences represent judgments of intrinsic or final or non-instrumental value. And if we accept that, suppose that these attitudes to lotteries are at least partly non-instrumental and we don't want to go through some fancy exercise of describing outcomes, uh, so suppose we grant that, there are actually frameworks that, um, that view attitudes to lotteries in exactly this way, for instance, uh, uh, Ari Stephenson and Richard Bradley um, take such a view. Suppose they're right. In that case, it doesn't follow that CPT preferences aren't irrational, but if they are irrational, it's because they represent incoherent ends. It's not that CPT preferences represent bad ways of serving an agent's ends, there's some sort of root incoherence in somebody's preferences if they don't abide by, say, the VNM axioms or the axioms of um, Stephenson and Bradley's um, decision theory. Uh, so if CPT preferences are rational, it's because they represent incoherent ends rather than bad means to the agent's ends. And, uh, oh, oops, I think this is missing, uh, missing a slide. Uh, in that case, um, means paternalism is just out of the question, or when we're doing CPT devising, it wouldn't be means paternalism. Uh, we're again in a situation where, well, there's an incoherence, there are different ways of uh, resolving that incoherence. It's not clear which of them is the agent's own preferred way. CPT devising wouldn't be means paternalism anymore. Uh, alternatively, we could say that it's just a kind of modeling norm that outcomes should be described so as to capture all the non-instrumental valuations. Um, this is just what outcomes are. They're descriptions of everything the agent non-instrumentally cares about. Um, and there's some evidence that economists see this as a modeling norm. So the reaction to, um, uh, to various behavioral anomalies is often, well, we should just re-describe outcomes. Um, and we see that in the case of gambling as well. If people enjoy gambling, we should put that in the description of outcomes. But if we take that route, we must be open to potentially quite complicated outcome descriptions. Um, so when agents care about kind of structural features of gambles, what we have to do is what's sometimes called global individuation. We have to, we have to put the description of the lottery that um, an outcome was part of into the description of the outcome. So potentially a description of the outcome could be quite, uh, quite complicated. And in practice, it's going to be really hard to get this right. Um, well, in practice, usually what's done is that outcomes are described in monetary terms. Um, when people construct CPT models, that's actually um, almost exclusively what's done in the kind of monetary, uh, in context where money is the main thing we're worried about. There are also um, CPT models when it comes to health outcomes. Um, in practice, it's going to be really hard to get this precisely right. And actually, this um, leads on to um, a second worry, which is, just the mere contestability of the normative interpretation of cumulative prospect theory. Uh, now, this is something that's actually discussed by economists themselves quite a bit. Uh, one way of, um, one question that brings out the problem uh, is which parts of the loss aversion and probability weighting that we, um, that we observe in agents are due to agents genuinely non-instrumentally caring about uh, losses or um, genuinely non-instrumentally caring about risk structure, and which of them are just um, uh, irrelevant ways in which uh, agents are being biased by their choice environments. Uh, so now we need to know um, whether when agents are loss averse, whether they, um, whether they have some kind of intrinsic reason to be loss averse or not. And this is the worry that um, even the proponents of this kind of approach share. So um, they will just read out this quote. Uh, they write, loss aversion that designates in this paper a deviation from expected utility, depending on psychological perceptions of reference points sensitive to strategically irrelevant reframings and decisions. It is this loss aversion that generates uh, discrepancies between probability and set equivalent measurements. If there are intrinsic reasons why losses with respect to status quo are more serious than corresponding gains, then we consider this effect a part of the genuine von neumann morgenstein utility function belongs to the expected utility model and does not depend on irrelevant refrainings. Our correction proposal concerns only the former loss aversion. So they're basically just saying what we're proposing only applies to those kinds of agents that don't intrinsically care about losses. But in practice, how are we supposed to know which kind of agent we're dealing with? 
Um, it seems the only way we can know that if we know is if we know quite a bit about the agent psychology, and we can make um, uh, we can make the same kind of point when it comes to probability weighting. Is it that agents non-instrumentally care about the structure of a gamble? Or is it that they are um, making some kind of cognitive error where they sort of represent the probability as greater than it is? Well, the only way of t telling uh, would be to, to ask them. Because it's something that we can't, um, that it's a harder question than merely finding a model that's empirically adequate. Um, we could have two agents who are both very well modeled by the exactly same CPT model, and for one of them, the basic utility function is completely accurate as a description of their ends, um, but for the other agent, uh, the same model fits, but actually um, the loss aversion parameter also captures something real about their intrinsic valuations. Uh, we, um, for, for the normative interpretation, this is going to be crucial. It matters for the mean split analyst, um, which it is, but we can't empirically tell them apart just by their preferences. We have to ask them what they Value. This is just a clarifying question. If you don't mind going back one slide to the quote, oh. yeah. they do seem to be alert to the problem that you mentioned here by by referring to a method of distinguishing. It seems to me uh, the, the two types of loss aversion, right? By talking about reframings. So I assume that what they have going on in the background is a is part of the test where the very same, well, same quote unquote gambles are presented in different frames. And if, in imagining your two people there, for the person for whom they would judge it to be irrational loss aversion would respond differently to those gambles, the, the supposedly same gambles differently framed, than the second person for whom the properties of the gamble are intrinsically significant, but allegedly the frame is not. Yes, I must admit, I can't remember exactly what they are referring to there. I'd have to look that up again. Um, but when I read it, I didn't think that they um, that they had solved, the, that they had some kind of test. They were just saying our model only applies to this kind of agent. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks, I need to go back to that. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering, even even when we ask individuals about, you know, are they, you know, is this really what they care about, or, or are they just doing that because? I mean, do we get sensible answers? I mean, I mean in a way, the criticism might be even worse, right? I mean, even if we could, you know, know quite a bit about people's psychology, we might not be able to figure that out. Um, yes, yeah, partly because this distinction between instrumental and non-instrumental valuations is one that is actually kind of hard to make sense of sometimes and uh, and hard to sort of make make precise it's a, it's a term we use but um, if you ask an agent well do you intrinsically non-instrumentally care about this or um, or just I, mean, I would give you a blank stare yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, uh, so, so it might be even worse than that <laughs> yeah so there might be no kind of fact of the matter even uh, or it's just it's a very hard question um and, and I think that response is kind of inadequate if we think that um, we're working in a generally anti-paternalist kind of framework, uh, because the kind of essential contestability of these kinds of questions alone should stop the means paternalist, it seems, because one of the core motivations um, uh, behind general anti-paternalism is that um, usually agents know better what's good for them, or the, the state usually doesn't have any kind of special insight in what, into what, what is good for agents. Now, we might be able to tell with the CPT model that somewhere, somehow, an agent is irrational, and maybe the policymaker has an advantage there, uh, but at least the agent herself knows what her ends are, or uh, actually maybe not even that. Um, but the, but the policymaker, unless they know a lot about the agent psychology, will just not be able to tell. And the kind of uncertainty and contestability of um, of this inter normative interpretation, I think, alone should make the general anti-paternalist um, just very hesitant to to interfere, and, um, motivated by a CPT biased uh, kind of model. So um, that was the second worry. Uh, the third one, and this will have to do with the 
with the second main challenge as well, uh, is expressing doubts about CPT utilities as, card, as a cardinal measure of non-instrumental value. So when, when we take the utility function and plug it into expected utility theory, uh, the motivation would be that the utility would be uh, is seen as a cardinal kind of measure, at least this is what people say um, they're doing off the agent's ends. Um, but there are actually doubts about that being the case. Um, this is, uh, so I want to show this by first talking about expected utility theory because uh, in expected utility theory, um, utilities don't necessarily need to be a cardinal measure of an agent's ends, and then my claim is there's no special reason to think that they would be um, under CPT. So with an expected utility theory, the utility function can, can on top of ideally providing an ordinal measure of an agent's non-instrumental values, by its shape also capture some degree of pure risk aversion, where by pure risk aversion I mean risk aversion that doesn't, um, that's not fully explained by, um, by decreasing a marginal value of the kind of good. It's not explained by the fact that the more you already have of a good, the less you value it. It's um, on top of that um, pure risk aversion. So for instance, an agent who values some good linearly, so every um, unit of the good is just as good as the last unit could be risk averse and still abide by all of the expect uh, the BNM EUT axioms. So uh, could abide by some independence axiom and all the other axioms uh, of the EUT if her utility function uh, is concave, or the way that she would be represented is with a concave utility function. Now this could be the case even if her subjective intrinsic value function say isn't. So this is what I mean by her valuing some good linearly. Um, so then, in those kinds of cases, the utility function, the shape of the utility function uh, is explained by pure risk aversion um, rather than uh, by a decreasing marginal kind of value of the good that you're talking about, that we're talking about. So uh, some of you were here last year um, during a discussion about the DNM representation of, uh, of utilities, and I used this example of the cookie monsters. Suppose the cookie monster values each cookie exactly as much as the last is the only thing that the cookie monster cares about. Um, the cookie monster could still be risk averse and be an expected utility maximizer. Um, you just have a concave uh, utility function. Uh, so the shape of the utility function to some extent can capture some uh, pure degree of risk aversion. And now the point is just that if this is the case in expected utility theory, there's just no special reason to think that the utility function within CPT um, shouldn't also, to some extent, um, uh, that the shape of the utility function in CPT shouldn't also, to some extent, be influenced by pure risk aversion. Um, nothing would guarantee that the same couldn't be true in CPT. In the end, it's, uh, it's an empirical question um, whether the utility function we get in CPT has a better claim than the utility function in expected utility theory for being a cardinal measure often agents ends. Um, if I understand correctly, in EUT models, we do get a systematic deviation between uh, riskless measures of strength of preference and the utility function in EUT, which sort of suggests that the utility function in EUT is not a cardinal measure of an agent's end, and there is some degree of uh, pure risk of um, So we get systematic deviations between these kinds of uh, two kinds of measures in EUT, there is some evidence that the CPT utility function uh, doesn't get um, uh, such deviations, or at least not as strong. Um, so we get a closer match between what an agent's um, subjectively evaluated degrees of, um, uh, of preference are for a particular good in a riskless context, and the utility function we measure within CPT. Uh, but it's only a couple of studies, and they're quite limited in the kinds of um, and the kinds of logics they're looking at. So again, we're sort of in the terrain of contestability um, and nothing but the model guarantees that we should have, that it should identify a cardinal measure of the agent's ends. Um, yeah. Okay, I think you left us. Oh yeah, sorry. So I don't know if this is important, but so in the case where someone um, who has diminishing marginal utility in the good, and also the case where somebody is like uh, purely risk averse, mm -hmm. and you said they'd be able to both be hacked by a concave utility. 
Presumably, you'd be able to empirically distinguish them if you gave them like examples of preferences under certainty, right? Because then they'd be able to measure with a linear rather than a concave yeah. one, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's what these, what these, uh, the kind of study that I'm mentioning here is doing. So there are other studies that show there's a systematic discrepancy between the utility function in EUT and these kinds of riskless measures of strength of preference. Uh, they come apart with EUT models. And there's like some evidence that they don't come apart in the same way for CPT, but the um, but I think the empirical evidence is quite weak still. So I think this might be a version of the worry, but framed just slightly differently. So you, one could say that um, the utility function that we get out of any such representation, whether it is the CPT uh, representation of an agent or an EUT representation, that utility function is really an ingredient in a, in a larger representation. And I mean, one point that one could make um, is that um, th this particular function um, doesn't really have a particularly well-defined meaning independently of the specific representation in which it uh, occurs. So on this picture, one needs to look at these representation theorems in a kind of holistic way. And um, if we uh, use um, a, a CPT representation theorem and say, well, here's the utility function, we are sort of detaching the meaning from it. If we take it out of the CPT utility function and then treat it as if it could equally well serve as an EUT utility function, or likewise, if we do an EUT representation and then take out the utility function and interpret it as, as something else, we are, we are making a mistake. And so this would be, um, yeah, I suppose, a version of this war. Maybe the idea that you use a representation like this and take out one ingredient of the representation, in a sense, one parameter of it, namely the utility function, and interpreting that as independently representing the ends, that, 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 yeah. that seems to be sort of methodologically problematic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, the def in defense of CPT, I think it, at least there's a hope of it it uh, being less of a sort of, uh, of doing better than expected utility theory in sort of disentangling the different ingredients of, of risk preferences. Because in expected utility theory, the utility function sort of captures both uh, intrinsic valuations and risk attitudes. We might sort of want to pull them apart, and maybe CPT can do that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's to some extent an empirical question whether the utility function in the end achieves that. But yes, uh, so it's a it's another kind of instance of the contestability of the normative interpretation, and it's just not clear whether the normative interpretation, this is a cardinal measure of the agent's ends, um, is is one that's justified. Uh, okay, I'll try and go through the the second. Uh, so this is just a challenge. Uh, uh, sorry, a summary of the first challenge, um, which came in the form of three worries. First is some non-instrumental values agents might have aren't naturally captured as attitudes to outcomes, even if they can be getting the description of outcomes right to pass out the agent's non-instrumental values is hard, and results are going to be contestable. And even if we get this right, the resulting utility measure may still not be a cardinal measure of the agent's ends. And so CPT devising is unlikely to meet the first condition I gave earlier for acceptable means for channels in the policy maker would need to have some reliable way of determining what the target agent's relevant ends or intrinsic non-instrumental values are, and they don't seem to have this. Uh, the second challenge, um, again, picks up this idea of um, permissiveness of instrumental rationality. So for the second challenge, I want to grant that the CPT utility function were again, again identified as a cardinal measure of the agent's ends. So we've somehow overcome all of the worries from the first challenge. So we've got this utility function that's a common measure of the agent's ends. Uh, a second challenge arises because of uh, what I call the permissiveness of instrumental rationality as well as expected utility theory as we've already seen it. So what I mean by permissiveness of instrumental rationality is uh, the claim that keeping fixed all of an agent's evaluative attitudes uh, to outcomes, instrumental rationality doesn't prescribe a unique preference relation over lotteries that the agent should adopt in pursuit of good outcomes. Uh, so take again the Cookie Monster example. We've said the Cookie Monster desires only cookies. 
Uh, should he forgo a certain 45 cookies in exchange for the chance to win 100 in a fair coin toss? Intuitively, if only the cookie monster's attitudes to the cookies are a cookie artist pick out his ends. Instrumental rationality doesn't prescribe an answer. Um, it, uh, it seems unclear what he should answer, and in fact it seems different cookie monsters could, uh, could answer differently, keeping the agent's ends fixed. There's some leeway. Uh, which is compatible with saying that extreme attitudes are irrational, that it would be irrational to forego a certain 99 cookies for the 50% chance of getting 100, or that it would be irrational to be extremely risk averse. But within, um, within some range, it seems that there's, there's um, uh, different kinds of um, attitudes are permissible. You could be more or less risk averse. So there may be some constraints, um, including, for instance, stochastic dominance as well. The independence axiom, if we want to abide by expected utility theory or extreme risk attitudes. Uh, so it's just the claim that there's some leeway. And we've already said that uh, this kind of permissiveness is consistent with the normative adequacy of expected utility theory because expected utility theory allows for um, uh, some pure risk aversion as long as the agent abides by the independence axiom. So suppose Cookie Monster has a cousin called Cookie Aficionado, feels exactly the same way about cookies as the Cookie Monster, and the Cookie Monster is indifferent between 50 cookies for certain and a 50% chance of 100, and Cookie Aficionado is indifferent between 40 cookies for certain and a 50% chance of 100. So in this example, the Cookie Monster is, um, uh, is risk neutral and Cookie Aficionado is risk averse. Uh, now they could both be expected utility maximizers uh, if they abide by the independence axiom. They would just be assigned different utility functions, even though they value ends in the same way. And for at least one of them, that utility function would be a cardinal measure of their ends. And now uh, having, so if we grant this kind of permissiveness, um, this creates the possibility of the problematic kind of means paternalism that I already mentioned earlier. So the kind of means paternalism that imposes lotteries on an agent that represent permissible ways of pursuing her own goals, but not her preferred ways of uh, the permissible ones of pursuing her own goals. Uh, so we're not overriding her ends, but we are overriding her preferences about how to, um, about how to pursue her ends. So for instance, uh, choosing a 50% chance of 100 cookies instead of 45 cookies for certain on behalf of, oh shoot, I turned them around. Uh, so suppose cookie aficionado is the risk of that one. Um, we're, we're choosing a 50% chance of 100 cookies instead of 45 for certain on behalf of cookie aficionado, even though she would have preferred 45 cookies for certain. Oh no, actually, I didn't make a mistake. So this, um, this would be a problematic kind of uh, means paternalism because um, her own preferred way of um, of pursuing her ends is perfectly permissible. Uh, it's permissible to be risk averse, and we're imposing a different way of um, pursuing her ends on her respective goals, but not her choice amongst the permissible ways of pursuing her goals. Uh, this is a problematic kind of means of paternalism because, firstly, the paternalist has no claim to knowing better, so the second condition isn't met. Uh, but also, one might think there's a kind of liberal neutrality that should also apply here that. Um, unless we have some good reason, uh, or in this case, we don't have a good reason to override an agent's uh, preferences about how to pursue your goals. In that case, we should again err on the side of, um, of allowing agents to uh, pursue their ends in their own ways. Now going back to cumulative prospect theory, um, what I want to say is that even if everything else goes well, CPT biasing will usually be means paternalism in this more problematic uh, kind of way. So granting the permissiveness of instrumental rationality and what we've um, said about the permissiveness of expected utility theory, what CPT biasing does isn't pick out the way in which an expected utility maximizer would pursue the agent's ends, but just one of the permissible ways and in particular, the risk neutral one. So we've granted that the CPT utility function is a cardinal measure of the agent's ends. If we say that the agent should maximize the probability weight of some of that utility function, we're saying 
she should pursue her ends in a risk neutral kind of way. So we're imposing this way of pursuing her goals on her. Um, there's no reason to think that this is in any meaningful way the agent's own way of pursuing her own goals. And in fact, I think a CPT agent who's engaged in a heavy kind of probability weighting and, uh, and who's got uh, uh, a high uh, loss aversion parameters uh, and so um, actually in her preferences displays quite a high degree of risk aversion, might find it quite alienating if risk neutrality was imposed on her. In a sense, what, what the um, proponents of CPT biasing are assuming is that the entire difference in the model that is made by probability weighting and loss aversion, that entire difference is all a mistake. Um, and to grant that that's all a mistake, we'd be assuming that the, the agent was trying but failing to be risk neutral. But we just have no special reason to think that this is what the agents were trying and failing to do. They, they are making some kind of mistake because CPT preferences are irrational, we've granted. Um, we, uh, we granted that they should have, should have abided by the independence axiom and they don't. So they've made a mistake somewhere, um, but we just can't assume that everything that's captured by probability weighting in loss aversion is all a mistake, that they were trying but failing to be risk neutral. Um, and in particular, when when the CPT preferences display a high degree of risk aversion, it seems um, implausible that the whole difference loss aversion probability we can make uh, was a mistake. Uh, if, they, um, if we ask, uh, I mean, so this is kind of, uh, the, the problem isn't only that it's implausible that they, that they are trying to be risk neutral, it's also that we just have no way of telling unless we ask them, uh, so if we made you abide by the independence axiom, how would you pursue your preferences? But once we've asked them, we're not being means paternalist or paternalist in any way anymore, we're just deferring to their uh, judgments, we're being deferential to their own judgments. And so that kind of um, obviates the need for any kind of paternalism. So um, it's implausible that they would be trying to be risk neutral, um, but we also just can't tell, and that already counts against um, any kind of paternalist interference. Well, one kind of rebuttal we might make here is that there's a difference to the cookie aficionado case, uh, which is that the cookie aficionado was an expected utility maximizer, and here we're dealing with someone who's not, they're irrational. And so you might think if you are dealing with an irrational agent, any arbitrary way of rationally making them pursue their ends is going to be fine. We can resolve, uh, we can make them rational in one of the arbitrary ways, maybe that's okay. Um, my response here would be that it's possible to respect the normative authority of expected utility theory while being a lot more deferential to the agent's instrumental preferences. So what we're doing with CPT debiasing, we're sort of throwing out all of the information we have about the agent's preferences over lotteries, all of the information we have about how they want to pursue their, their ends. Um, but actually we can be a lot more deferential to what we know about their preferences about how to pursue their ends. Firstly, a lot of the time when we're contemplating interfering, it, we're contemplating interfering into the single choices. Um, but note that none of the CPT agents' preferences violate expected utility theory individually. They only do so in combination. Uh, it's in combination that preferences violate the independence axiom. So if we're only ever dealing with one single choice, uh, it seems like there's no strong enough case to interfere uh, because that choice could have been part of an expected utility model. So the idea is don't interfere where no violation of CPT is manifest. Uh, so it would only be in the kinds of contexts where we're interfering in series of choices where the violation of CPT, uh, of, of, uh, sorry, where no violation of expected utility theory is manifest. So it wouldn't be interfere in the kinds of cases where people are making series of choices and the violation becomes manifest. And even in those cases, the more respectful and generally anti-paternalist way of proceeding would be to oppose the expected utility model with the closest fit to the agent's preferences. Um, and this can have quite different results to CPT debiasing. So take again an agent that, um, that displays CPT preferences that are quite risk averse, a strong probability weighting, um, high loss aversion parameter. CPT debiasing would make them risk neutral. Um, 
but the closest expected utility model to the agent would likely um, feature a strongly concave utility function and so be more uh, risk averse. So this is a different procedure and it's arguably more respectful um, to the agents, to what we know about the agents' preferences about how to pursue their own goals. We're only making the minimal deviations that we have to make in order to make them abide by expected utility theory, which we think is the normatively correct theory. So um, what I've argued is that even if expected utility theory is normatively adequate, and CPT is descriptively adequate, CPT devising isn't a defensible kind of means determinism because firstly the CPT utility fraction is at best too contestable a measure of an agent's ends, and secondly because um, against the background of the permissiveness of its strength and rationality and expected utility theory under risk that I've argued for, CPT devising is by anti patrol standards not deferential enough to the agent's preferences regarding how to pursue their ends. There are different uh, ways of being more deferential towards the agent's preferences about how to pursue hands. And that's it, thank you.